Hello, I'm Diana Rostad. Welcome to Behind the Book. I'm going to talk about the history and inspiration for my novel, You Belong Here Now. You'll learn about the orphan trains that ran in the 19th and early 20th centuries. You'll hear about life in 1920s Montana and wild horses out west. But first, let me tell you what my story is about. You Belong Here Now is set in 1925 Montana and the story begins when these three brave kids from New York board the orphan train headed west. You've got a tiny girl who won't talk, an Irish boy who lost his whole family to Spanish flu, and a dangerous boy from Hell's Kitchen. They get going on this train and stop after stop they are overlooked. Charles from Hell's Kitchen is so big for his age and he's covered in bruises, looks like he's trouble. And Patrick is Irish, everyone was prejudiced against them back then. And little Opal doesn't even look like she can carry a bucket. So they get to the end of the line and the train goes dark one night and Charles turns to Patrick and he says, I'm getting off this train. And so these two boys get up to go leave the train and lo and behold, little Opal is standing right behind them. So they jump off the train and they end up on a cattle ranch in Montana with Nara. Nara is living with her folks. She's about 33, she's brisk, she's hardened. She really wants to run her father's really large cattle operation, but he doesn't think that anyone is gonna to listen to a woman in 1925 Montana. So she's had to scrub away every bit of her femininity to rise up in that male dominated world. She walks like a man, she talks like a man, she sounds like a man. So when she sees these kids, she wants nothing to do with them. She doesn't wanna get caught in the kitchen, you know, wiping noses and making sandwiches. So she works them without mercy, hoping they'll run off. But they don't, they buck up and they show spirit. And she begins to take to them despite herself. So when Charles is jailed for freeing a band of wild horses that was rounded up for slaughter and an abusive mother from New York comes to claim the youngest, Nara and her family do the unthinkable in order to save them. Next up, I wanna tell you a little history about the orphan train. The orphan train was a fascinating adoption phenomenon back between 1853 and 1929. There were many catalysts to this and not surprisingly, the railroad itself was the biggest. You see in mid 19th century, the United States began surveying railroad lines to the Pacific. Here's a picture of some of the old lines. But they needed people to go west and form cities, places to ship goods, take folks back and forth. There just wasn't much out west yet. So why build it unless you have people in commerce out there? So the railroad companies developed campaigns, posters and flyers were sent to Europe and the rest of the world. And they portrayed America as the you know, land of opportunity and milk and honey and people came steamships full of them. New York became overwhelmed with immigration as over 4 million people arrived to the US beginning in the mid 19th century. Ellis Island, as you can see here, was a busy place. Many of our grandparents got their first look of America right here. From history, we know they came fleeing political unrest, revolutions and famines, all with the promise of a better life. That for most didn't happen. The railroad companies advertised land of opportunity, second chances, but our cities became so overpopulated. There were too many laborers and not enough work. People were often jammed 10 to a room. Here's a picture of a crowded tenement. I can't imagine living like that and where did everybody sleep? Disease was rampant, food became scarce and young children were forced to work or they were abandoned. These folks, they brought their dreams, their desire to work hard, but often what they discovered when they got to America was no way to go west without money. And the gangs and the rackets they ran on immigrants were real as portrayed in the popular films, Gangs of New York and Far and Away. The Civil War only made it worse. Lots of kids were left homeless. And all these dire conditions led people to abandon their children on the streets, doorsteps of wealthy people, churches, and finally, 
to the growing institutions such as the New York Foundling Hospital, which was run by the Children's Aid Society. It's estimated that 30,000 children at one time were living on the streets of New York. And it wasn't long before these kids formed gangs of their own, filching food, sleeping in alleys, huddled together in little piles in the corners everywhere, trying to stay warm at night. In 1853, Charles Loring Brace, a Method minister, and a group of businessmen formed the Children's Aid Society to help these homeless children. Brace authored many books over his career. Here's a couple of titles. The Best Method of Disposing of Our Pauper and Vagrant Children and the Dangerous Classes of New York and 20 Years Work Among Them. Not very sensitive titles for the work he did, but Charles Loring Brace as Secretary of the Children's Aid Society built orphanages, lodgings for newsboys who sold papers on the streets. He did good work. But what the society is most famous for is the idea of sending children out to the farms and ranches on trains. Brace was sure that God-fearing folks would take in these children and give them warm homes, structure, fresh air and sunshine. The children would learn good work ethics on the ranches and farms in our heartland and out west. So the Children's Aid Society rescued children on the streets. They cleaned them up, they cut their hair, gave them a few changes of clothes and a little cardboard suitcase that they took on the train with them. And they headed for the Midwest and beyond, though the majority of the kids did end up in the Midwest. During the orphan train's run, it's estimated that over 120,000 children were adopted in 45 states and Canada and Mexico. They stood on train train platforms, stages of playhouses, churches across the US. Standing up there took so much bravery. The folks often wanted to see their muscles, look at their teeth and understand their general health. So as you can imagine, it would have been humiliating at times. Folks took some of them on as real family members and others accepted them on more for the work. The older a child was, the more likely they were being taken on for the work. And so the contracts changed from true adoption until they reflected more indentured servitude as the children got older. For instance, a child over a certain age didn't have to have schooling while those younger did, and they had to be treated as members of the household and go to church. For some older kids, you know, at the age of 18, the folks had to either pay them or they had to move on and find other prospects and homes. But there are so many stories of folks who truly adopted these children as their own and loved them. Back in the 19th century, kids died of all kinds of diseases that they couldn't cure back then. And people valued larger families, you know, for working on the farms and the ranches. And I know my own mother comes from a family of 10. Uh, she grew up on a cotton farm in Arkansas. From 1853, trains took children to 45 states, but as the rest of the country began to have, you know, their own orphan populations and the trains, they just began to take fewer children from the Eastern seaboard. The other reasons were that, you know, a lot of these kids that were on the trains had backgrounds, um, you know, they'd been in trouble, they'd been in gangs, and they had learned how to survive by breaking the law. So states began to decline the orphan train on that basis too. The children from the orphan train were often referred to as train riders. And at times they had trouble shaking that image in their new communities. In my book, Opal, Charles and Patrick struggle with the label of being train riders. Patrick is also Irish and has even a higher boundary to cross with the folks in Yellowstone County. Charles has learned to survive using his fists and to protect his new siblings from slurs at school and other troubles. Charles comes out swinging and he frightens people. He's so big and he beats people bloody and now they've branded him a dangerous troublemaker. So the last orphan train ran to Texas in 1929, officially ending an era of foster care and adoption, never to be seen again. Next up, I want to talk to you about the inspiration for the Montana setting in my novel, You Belong Here Now. 
The inspiration for my novel came back in 2007 when I came across this article about the orphan train. I was astounded. I had never known about this adoption phenomena. So I researched it and found all these photos of kids from the 1920s peering out of train windows and standing on platforms all lined up and in new clothes. They looked determined and brave. It reminded me of a group of kids from the South Central Los Angeles area that I used to work with. You see, I had a caseload of youthful offenders and it was my job to get them employed. I would pick them up after they paroled, take them around to get clothes and then to job interviews. When they came to me in the Youth Authority to be a part of my program, they had that same look of hope and determination in their eyes. The kids on my case loan had done terrible things, but they still had hope, just like those kids on the old trains who came from the streets and had been in gangs. So when I saw those old photos, I knew I was the right person to write this story. I just didn't know where to set it. Then one year, my father came to Christmas and he brought all these amazing photos of the family ranches in Montana. They had stories and anecdotes written on the back. It broke open this whole big world where I could see my characters inside. In a lot of these pictures, you'll see people wearing boots. So I asked my dad, what's up with all these boots? He told me it was gumbo mud. After the spring rains, the mud becomes so thick that the farther you walked, the taller you got. In one of the first scenes in my book, Charles climbs up onto the porch and takes his boots off and puts them right next to a long line of boots. And he finally feels like he's a part of something. Charles falls in love with Montana in the quiet. Back in Hell's Kitchen, he slept on the street and there was always racket. In Montana, all he can hear is boots scuffing the dirt as he walks or the tail of a horse whisking around in the wind. And up above, there's so much big sky. He can finally see the sunshine. My father also brought pictures of old cars and they worked differently back then. The roads were terrible, dirt and chuck holes, flats were common. My dad said they often carried two spares. Here's a picture of my grandfather, his dad and brother changing a flat on their Model T out in Wyoming. And you can see they're having a really good time of it too. As a child, I never could understand why my grandfather was so fascinated with the old steam trains, but they revolutionized his life in rural Montana, much like the internet did for all of us in the 90s. Once those trains came, they were able to get fruits they never had before, order just about anything from the Sears catalog, including the parts to make a windmill. Here's a picture of my grandfather's ranch house. It's hard to see, but there's a small propeller mounted to the roof. As a boy, my grandfather walked miles to the Piper train station to pick up the makings of a windmill to light just one light bulb. He said he was awful tired of lugging that car battery, but he climbed up onto the top of their roof and rigged it all up. He carved a propeller out of a board. He said that it worked until the car battery ran out. Folks back then were desperate to have light at night. You can imagine evening after evening of sitting by a gas lamp. It inspired him to do all that work to get that one light bulb going in his house. Funny thing is my grandfather became an electrician and had his own shop. If it plugged in and had a circuit board, he could fix it. So even though his first experiment as a boy didn't work out real well, he kept at it. My grandfather also loved to sing and play the guitar and all the songs in the book are songs he sang or wrote, Little Footprints in the Snow. It was about a little girl who went missing in a blizzard on her way back from school. The Old Side Hill Gouger was a song about a mythical creature. It was legend in those parts, meant to keep kids from roaming the hills at night. Back in the 1920s, the Side Hill Gouger wasn't the only creature roaming the hills at night. Wild horses were there too, and they play a big part in my novel. You belong here now. So I'm going to tell you a little something about wild horses next. Wild horses have roamed this continent for eons. Even before the Europeans got here, the natives were gentling and breeding them. When I was researching my book, I looked for all the flora and fauna that existed in 1925 Montana. 
It's important to me to make sure that everything was there in that time and place. It's in my story. So during my research, I came upon the prior range Mustangs that roam that part of Montana. Now I grew up out West and I never knew we had bands of wild horses roaming our national public lands. I must have spent a good day looking at the pictures and researching these beautiful creatures when I found a picture of a blue roan and I knew immediately this horse had to be in my novel. They look blue in certain lights and have black manes and tails, something straight out of Hollywood. Unfortunately, I soon discovered that ranchers back then rounded up the Mustangs to preserve forage for their cattle and sheep. Once they took possession of the horses, they sold them off, often to slaughterhouses where they would be canned for chicken feed. The mere thought of that broke my heart. And so in my book, it also breaks Patrick's heart. Patrick comes from Ireland and grew up helping his grandfather at the racetracks. Patrick is a real equestrian. He falls in love with the wild horses and is often out in the fields making friends with them. But Patrick and Charles are forced to round up that band of wild horses for an adjacent rancher who wants to preserve his grass for his stock. It's a terrifying process for wild horses. Many of them die, breaking legs in their flight. Some of the young ones literally run their little tender hooves off. Back in those days, they used to use old jute rope corrals and chutes to round them up and keep them penned. I'm sorry to say we haven't made much progress in nearly a hundred years. The Bureau of Land Management is still rounding them up, but with helicopters. After that, the horses are placed in small pens and have miserable lives. And even though it's illegal, many of these horses are being adopted by folks who sell them off to the slaughterhouses for meat. Here are just a few pictures of the bands that still exist throughout the Western United States. Most of our wild horses live in Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, and Wyoming. They are gorgeous creatures that live in family bands and have long-standing bonds. When they forage our native grasses, the seeds to these grasses are not destroyed in their stomachs as they are in beef cattle. And so they make great protectors of our public lands. There are organizations throughout the US that document, photograph, and protect these majestic creatures. And there is hope amongst these organizations that the roundups will be banned and birth control measures will become the standard for controlling wild horse populations. The state of Nevada, which holds our largest population of wild horses today, is committed to using humane measures by using birth control. Hey, it works for people, right? <laughs> You know, when I look back at the research and discovery for this book, I'm astounded at all that I have learned, even about my own family. Writing is truly an enriching occupation for me. Research and discovery is my favorite part of the writing process. It enables me to breathe life and truth into my stories, and most importantly, hope. Whenever I look back into our shared history, I come across the American spirit, whether it's a wild mane flying in the wind or the look on a young boy's face as he boards a train for a new life or climbs on top of his home to mount a windmill, I always see determination, bravery, and hope. So as I continue to write, readers can expect, and this is my author's mantra, that I will always write big hearted novels for wide audiences. And what that means is, I will always take readers on an epic journey with hopeful themes and a wide cast of characters with someone for everyone to root for. And now I hope you've enjoyed this sneak peek behind my novel and learning some of the history that went into writing. You belong here now. Thank you for joining me.